My history of pulmonary fibrosis is that I was diagnosed a couple years back um, and I um, went through a, a clinical review at the University of California, San Francisco, which is also just referred to as UCSF, and you know, had that uh, diagnosis confirmed by a panel of experts there, um, which will be important later. The um, pulmonary fibrosis that I had was detected very early, probably much earlier than it would be in many cases. So uh, I went through a series of a couple, few years where I um, went in for pulmonary function tests every four months um, based on the approach recommended by my pulmonologist to monitor the progression of the pulmonary fibrosis. And um, it really had been very stable. And, and in many cases, it wasn't even completely certain I had pulmonary fibrosis, despite the, the medical opinion, because it was so early. Um, but it really hadn't impacted my lifestyle other than a, a chronic cough, which was more annoying than anything. So uh, that was a, the case up until the spring, and I had a pulmonary function test in March or April. Um, subsequently this June, I went to Mount Lassen with a few friends. We take a trip once each year, and we went to Mount Lassen this year. It's about 5,000 feet in elevation um, where we were staying. And then we went higher as we were, went on day activities. Well, I, I noticed a distinct, definite um, you know, shortness of breath. And so upon my returning, I went in for another pulmonary function test and found that I'd lost 35% of my lung capacity. So um, this, of course, was rather alarming and um, distressing news. So um, once that happened, I went back to the uh, physician at UCSF who had I worked through with the um, panel review. And uh, my pulmonologist, um, Dr. Nissim, um, referred me to Dr. Tony Schum, is this um, pulmonologist that was part of this panel review um, with the status of my condition. And then I was then referred to the uh, transplant team at UCSF um, for assessment for a transplant. And so this was in about July of this year. So this, is, this, this process or assessment for a transplant normally takes you know four, five, six months. Uh, it involves a lot of tests, a lot of meetings. Um, we really fast-tracked it um, and it got it done in about two months. So by the time we were in the um, end of August, very early September, I um, was approved um, in early September for uh, a transplant was put on the list. And um, at that point, my score put me at a lung allocation score, or it's called LAS, of 54. Um, based on my oxygen needs at the time, which I think were about six liters per minute. And um, I subsequently, um, a couple weeks later, um, was called in for a transplant and um, went through that first of my two dry runs to date. So um, I'm going to transition then into a bit of a description of what these dry runs were like and um, kind of catch you up to the rest of what's happened to date. So, um, you know, the interesting thing about both of those two um, dry runs is I got the call when I was least expecting it. Um, and um, you get a call and um, in general, you know, I think the first one was say 5.30 at night and we were asked to get to UCSF by seven. We're about half an hour away, maybe 40 minutes away. So we had time to make some quick calls and some friends helped us line up, uh, you know, care for our kids overnight and off we went. So um, in both cases, um, it was pretty similar in terms of the timing. Uh, once we got there, uh, we checked in and um, there's a ad admitting um, process and you get admitted and then you have to wait for a room if a room's not available. Second time that took several hours. And once we got into a room, then they get ready for the pre-op um, assessment. So um, that pre-operation process involves 
first of all, um, they want to rerun your blood work, make sure nothing has changed. So they quickly come in and take the blood samples and then rush them off to the labs for the blood work. Next, they want to do a chest x-ray. Once again, make sure that they've got a very current read on what your um, chest and lungs look like. And um, make sure you don't have pneumonia or anything that would be a surprise. Um, then they do a echocardiogram and they put an IV in you so you're ready and they hook you up to the machine. And in both cases, then right around midnight, we were um, done with their process and told that it was now time to wait. Um, the first time the surgery was scheduled for about 4.30 a.m. The second time it was scheduled for about 7 a.m. Um, in both cases, um, those times were pushed back as um, we get, reached the kind of timetable. And um, after we got rolled down to the operating room, and I'm on a gurney and laying there waiting right in front of the operating room, we're delayed a couple more times for about another hour. And um, in what seemed like a coincidence at the time, in both cases, someone came out and said, that uh, the lungs were a no-go because of pneumonia. And the um, first time it was a surprise. The second time they came out and said, oh, the lungs had pneumonia, it was a real surprise. Um, like, you don't think about pneumonia coming up that often. But what it turns out is when you better understand some of the dynamics behind the scenes from a donor perspective, these donors are on life support um, and um, they're not eligible for this um, wonderful tr exchange of life-giving organs until after they're brain dead, but they're on life support. And in many cases, they've been on life support for an extended period of time in a hospital and immobile, which is why the lungs can get pneumonia. But that's um, also why there's so few eligible donors is to, because of this particular perfect alignment of the stars that has to happen um, where someone being the donor has to be on life support and brain dead um, and fit all the eligible criteria for it to work. So um, that really brings us up to date. Um, it's now been three weeks since the last dry run. And um, since that time period, my oxygen needs at rest have increased to 10 liters per minute. And I um, have seen my lung allocation score go up to 69. It's been very challenging to be here at home and, and manage my oxygen needs here at home. <coughs> but um, at this point, there are a lot of benefits to being at home instead of in the hospital. And so um, that's where I am. So um, life um, right now is really a holding pattern, waiting for the call, we call it the call, from UCSF to come in for the transplant. And so um, I'll just give you a quick overview of the daily routine and um, you know, then I'll go into some of the specifics. So um, I tend to um, wake up um, in the middle of the night, starting at about midnight, every hour or so, um, I, I'm kind of constrained at this point, sleeping on my right side, um, as I find that any other position, I have great difficulty breathing. And um, so the, the right side gets awfully cramped and sore, um, which is why I'm shifting around every hour or so. And um, my mouth gets really dry, so I'm drinking some water every hour or so. Um, so I get up around seven, and then after I wake up, one of the first things that I confront is that every morning at some point, I'm going to go through some coughing spasms. And, you know, my pulmonologist thinks it's just the lungs need to flex and crackle and break up some of the stiffness. So, um, you know, it's hard because it may be one of the first things that happens as soon as I try to get dressed in the morning, or it might be that it takes place a little bit later in the morning. You know, 
kind of one of those good news, bad news things because if it happens right away, I'm not quite as well prepared for it. But, you know, if it doesn't happen right away, then I know it's going to be happening. And there's kind of that um, hanging over your head um, until it's out of the way. Um, so the coughing spasms are uh, probably not that long in terms of absolute length, but um, really challenging. Um, and here's why. Um, one of the hardest things with pulmonary fibrosis is keeping enough oxygen in your lungs. When you cough, you push all the oxygen and air out of your lungs. The other thing that happens, for me at least, is my nose runs profusely. And the um, oxygen um, cannulas is what they call these things, deliver the air through your nose, and if it's full of mucus, you can't breathe very well. So I've got this rebreather mask, and um, it's hooked up to my portable oxygen tank. And so I have this handy so that when and if that coughing spasm happens, I can quickly put it on my face and then breathe through my, no my mouth. Um, and that helps me get through those coughing spasms. And um, those typically last, uh, I've never actually measured it, but I'd guess the coughing part is five minutes. And then it takes me about half an hour or so after that before I'm more or less functional again. Um, after the coughing, I tend to be pretty weak and um, just wrung out and tired and I tend to have a headache. So um, that's, that's the toughest part of the day is the mornings. Um, and then, you know, incrementally over time, by say 10 o'clock or so, I'm feeling pretty good by 10. From 10 to roughly four o'clock is probably my good time window of the day. And um, what I'll tend to do is um, put on this, it's a mustache oximizer. And the, the benefit of this is, um, first of all, you get to show off your gear to everybody and you know, get a good grin out of everyone um, because you know, my, my daughter wants to put a mustache on it. Um, but it's, it's kind of funny looking, but what it does is it lets you have a little reservoir and it's also very quiet. Um, you might not think about it, but the air going through these tubes at a very high speed creates kind of a venturi or um, a, a lot of noise, much like a, an airplane, and it's really hard to hear. Um, this one is very quiet for the large part, which is a real blessing, and that's why I'm wearing it right now. Now, um, this one right here, is kind of the one most transplant candidates are wearing. And um, it's just a kind of classic cannula. Um, it's got no reservoir. Um, this is the one I wear when I sleep um, because this gets in the way if I try to put my head on a pillow. Um, it's one that's very loud um, and it's not as efficient because it doesn't have the reservoir. Um, this is my favorite. Um, in terms of effectiveness, it's called a pendant. It's got this big reservoir right here. Um, you wear it where it hangs down right around to the middle of your chest, just like a big amulet or like your, your wrapper bling. Um, now what it does is really gives you this nice big reservoir to draw on, um, but it doesn't have anything like this, so it's extremely noisy. Um, that's the one I wear when I exercise. So if I'm walking around the neighborhood or when I go to my pulmonary rehabilitation class where I exercise, <coughs> that's the one I wear. Now, um, I think I've covered my gear. The um, other reality of my day is I just spend a lot of time here in the chair um, reading, um, corresponding on the internet, Got a lot of wonderful people posting stuff on Facebook. So I uh, spent a little time on Facebook saying hello to everyone and um, watching some of my reality TV shows. Um, one that I've been watching, for example, is called Fast and Loud. I, I love the shows about 
guys fixing up old cars and um, it's a fun way to pass the time. So, you know, it's a very different reality than what I'm used to, um, you know, where I was working long days and then trying to grab any available moment to exercise on my mountain bike or work in the yard and keep up my vegetable garden. Um, spending all this time sitting is just a very different reality. Um, but that's what I'm doing right now is just trying to preserve, you know, energy and, you know, exercise as much as I can and um, stay ready for the transplant.